Good morning, Andrea Johnson here. You are tuned in to the Intentional Optimist guest speaker series. And today we have Sophie Wadsworth, who I'm going to call a story coach. Is that valid? Yes. <laughs> um, if you pay attention to my podcast, you will have heard her on episode 80, which aired this last Monday. And we got some amazing stories from her including the fact that she played tackle football growing up, um, all kinds of great lessons she learned as a female leader from her mom. And it is just a really good episode to kind of get a better understanding of why stories are important. So I invited her to come on here and give us a little mini course. And over in my Facebook group, we use these in the guide section in order to give anybody new coming in who maybe wasn't paying attention to be able to see what we can learn from the past guests that have been there. So this is part educational, part outreach, and I'm really excited to share a little bit, Sophie, because when I got my Maxwell Leadership Coaching Certification, part of it was I had to do some speaking training. And one of the things that the, the, the trainer there did was he really went into story. But, you know, when you're doing something like online and you're kind of doing it really fast, we don't really take the time to learn that well. And I think that when you do it really well, you can really connect. So you've said that basically you're going to share with us today how we build emotional connection and maybe start with just a brief bit of your background and then tell us why we need to do it and then how. Is that val is that okay? Sure. And and I'll probably jump in with questions because that's who I am. <laughs> Well, my name is Sophie Wadsworth, and I am a speech and story coach and consultant working with leaders, both in the business and the nonprofit space on how do they craft and tell their stories so that they can really engage their audiences and inspire other people and serve their mission, whatever it might be. And I'm a former uh, teacher and a nonprofit executive. So I draw on those um, as well as a former tackle football player, as Andrea <laughs> said. And I'm thrilled to be here it. today um, to talk about story. It's one of my favorite things to share with other people. And as to the why, why does it matter that we become better storytellers? Why does it matter that we use story in our lives and in our work? I would say that we are wired for story as human beings that down to the deepest core of our bodies and our minds, story is what engages us with each other and what helps us talk about what we've learned along the way, how not to get eaten up by the tiger, how to build the culture that we want, how to um, engage each other in community in the ways that we dream of. Well, so and you know, I was thinking too about oral history was handed down through all of our ancient cultures and it, you know, written history is fairly new. So this is something like, I love the way you said, it's just like kind of in our DNA, it's in our bones. So um, I love that. I love that. Why? That's a really good reason. Yes. It was a way of sort of stretching out the light of the day that um, people would tell stories and extend the day by talking about what they had experienced out there um, in the fields, in the woods. So it is, and it's very um, spoken of today because people recognize that it's a wonderful way to communicate what we care about most. Um, story is very powerful in sharing um, our mission, as I said, and also if we wanna share information and data that can be very dry, story is an extremely powerful way to wrap that information up so that it's memorable. Sure. And ultimately, yeah. we need to help people remember things so that they get the value of what we're saying. Um, and we need to help them feel in order to internalize the power of what we're saying and the power of the truth that we're creating. Yeah. Well, and you know, I'm a Sunday school teacher. And when we think about, for those of us who were in Sunday school when we were little, you think about like the felt boards or all the stories that we told in order to have, to be able to remember the truths that were taught there. And um, so I love those, the way you just illustrated that. So, um, and the fact that it's not dry, because there's a lot of stuff we have to learn that's dry and a good story makes all the difference, doesn't it? Yes, it does. <laughs> 
does for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, teach us. Well, sure. So one thing I thought I might share with you and um, all of the listeners who are out there is some examples and some thoughts I have about how we emotionally connect okay. with our listeners or our readers. So these are for people who are creating stories, whether it's for the page, and that includes the screen um, where people are reading the stories, or whether it's for the stage at the microphone speaking, um, whether it's at the kitchen table or the conference table. So I wanted to give you that um, context first, that this is for anywhere that you tell stories, um, what I'm about to share. Cool. And what I think is especially powerful that I might give you today is some examples of how we can get better at building detail into our stories mm. and how we can emotionally engage um, our listeners and our readers. So how do we do that? How do we engage and how do we engage people um, in terms of how they feel? Uh, think first about how you want your reader or your listener to feel. And when you've got a good image of that, do you want them to be outraged? Do you want them to be um, inspired? Do you want them to laugh and feel that lightness and wackiness of being alive? And with that in mind, let's turn and think about, well, how do you build that into what you are sharing on the page? And one way is we locate folks in the place that the story is taking place. We ground them in an actual situation in the physical world. One way I like to think about this is think about the setup for a joke, <laughs> that you might hear someone tell a joke that goes, a hedgehog walked into a bar, <laughs> for instance. <laughs> There's a few things already happening there in the setup for a joke, which is a great example of a setup for a story. And that is that you have a character. It might be a cast of characters in some stories. The hedgehog has entered the movie <laughs> and we have, a, we have a place. It's a bar. And important for a story, there's already some tension, some conflict going on. Maybe What's the not hedgehog doing in the bar? <laughs> <laughs> it might just be where he wants to be. Um, but what, yeah, what is going to happen next with right. this hedgehog? Um, will it survive going from A to B for, the, for starters? And um, who else is there? And what's this all about? So giving them a sense of place where we are and making sure that we then give them some sensory detail. And I thought for fun, because um, I'm a teacher like you, Andrea, and I'm a, a reader, um, ultimately, Reading and writing are inseparable, mm -hmm. that when we read, in a sense, we are working with words in our own mind. And when we write, we are calling on all that we have in a sea of words together. Um, so I love reading. And one author I love um, in the nonfiction realm is Cy Montgomery. So I thought I'd pull out her book, which is called, just to keep it light, The Good Good Pig. <laughs> And I thought I would just share with you how she opens because okay. she brings us right into a character and a place. So see what you okay. think. It's chapter one, which is titled Runt Hood. Christopher Hogwood came home on my lap in a shoebox. On a rain drenched April evening, so cold the frogs were silent so gray we could hardly see our barn. My husband drove our rusting Subaru over mud roads, sodden with melted snow. And it goes on from there about pig manure. <laughs> and that this did not seem an auspicious time to make the life-changing choice of adopting a pig. <laughs> well, I mean, just, <laughs> just the idea that they have a rusting Subaru is like, Mind blowing um, because they don't rust. You know, they're not supposed to rust. But um, I, you're right. It was um, she. She named the pig. She the pig was on her lap. 
um, melting snow, rusting Subaru, um, frogs were silent, which tells you like where she lives, that there should be frogs. And um, yeah, that's a lot of place. Uh, and this, the sensory pieces too, it's like, it, it's cold enough that they need to have the heater on in the car. Um, okay, great. So it's like really good example of setup and, um, and being able to do that. So how do you, how do you do that? How do you create that kind of setup for yourself? Well, that's the, the question, isn't it? And one really valuable um, technique that I offer when I coach people is to think about a story much like a movie. We're all so familiar with that as a form and it's so visual. And think about the story that you want to write as a movie that you want to actually create in your reader's mind, in your listener's mind. So you don't want to say that we brought the pig home um, and, you know, drove 60 miles um, because that's just like very factual. That's almost like I'm talking to a cop about why I was speeding. Pig. And a pig. I'm bringing the pig home. Yeah. You know, it's very like just the facts, ma'am. Yeah. So you want as a, as a really good storyteller to give detail so we can actually picture the scene. It's not just mm. vaguely a pig in a car. It's a pig in a shoebox. Cool. And it's not just a car. It's a Subaru and it's rusting. Yeah. They've had it a long time. Yeah. Which says <laughs> something about the character in the story, right? Um, I mean, it's not coming home in a Mercedes Benz that's mm -hmm. just glossy with wax or whatever they use in the car wash. It's a rusting Subaru. So it tells you already something about the context of the people that are going to be involved with this pig, who's already been named, by the way, Christopher Hogwood. True. Great that's idea. another piece. Yes. Great <laughs> idea to share a name because that really that's makes quite a, a name for a pig. Yeah. How and did it come to be called Christopher Hogwood? Hogwood <laughs> makes me think of other th other stories, right? And, and Angela actually shared, maybe they live in Oregon where it's always wet. <laughs> right? <laughs> exactly. Yep. It happens to be New Hampshire, but it tells you something about what they're dealing with, right? Yeah. Mud season. It doesn't happen anywhere. Thank you for that. And we also, as storytellers, get to choose what details we share. So choosing that it's rusting is going to evoke something about maybe the wealth of the person driving the car, the humidity and the dampness. The shoebox, um, you know, has this homey feeling, you know, it's not a vet with their little special carrier and it might not even be a pet owner, right? It's not their pig yet. They've just got a shoebox. Right. Um, and it goes on from there. You pointed out the frogs that, that places us in nature, which is so grounding. Yeah. And the movie is playing in our heads. Right. It is. This pig in the shoebox, the rust, whatever, whatever catches us. The story I needs hear a, I almost hear a narrator. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Cy Montgomery is um, really so gifted as a writer. So um, it's easy to find lots of examples in her work. And she loves writing about animals. Um, and animals are so evocative. Even if you're writing about something very dry and technical, if you can slip an animal in, your writing will be more captivating and memorable. Even if it's only making a comparison that the computer is like a hedgehog. A sloth. Very <laughs> sloth. sloth. Yeah. <laughs> the computer. It's like a sloth today. <laughs> and you're talking to IT. You want them to feel that your pain and please come fast <laughs> as the sloth is about to take a nap. It was already slow. So, um, that's, that's a little bit about detail, especially I've given visual detail. Okay. Um, she goes on and talks about the smell, um, that their clothes smell like pig. So you're bringing another sense in. Um, think about all the senses, the sound, the sight, the smell, the touch, the feeling, right? It's cold, it's damp. All of those will bring the story to life for people. Okay. So the, the first piece we have here that I have down is that um, we've built a location, but we're getting better at telling detail and do that through our senses based on how we want them to feel. Mm -hmm. What's next? Mm -hmm. What's next? Well, we want also a certain um, vulnerability. Mm. Um, we want to give the reader a sense of our humanity and our realness, um, you might say. Um, so... 
I thought I would share another piece um, to reemphasize the sensory detail from a different scenario, a different okay. scene. Okay. Um, but also, I want you to listen for what the feeling is that you get from this, even though it's a very um, visual sensory opening of a scene. And I love poetry. Mm. So I often draw on poems for examples of writing that has very rich detail. This one is by a poet named Lee Young Lee uh, from a book, his first book called Rose, which was published in the 80s. Okay. And the poem is called Early in the Morning. So just try to get a sense of the feeling of the scene. Early in the morning, while the long grain is softening in the water, over a low stove flame, before the salted winter vegetable is sliced for breakfast, before the birds, my mother glides an ivory comb through her hair, heavy and black as calligrapher's ink. She sits at the foot of the bed. My father watches, listens for the music of comb against hair. Wow. I have, I have chill bumps. <laughs> and I think part of that is because I, I grew up in Korea. So this sounds, yeah. So um, I don't know if Lee Young Lee is Korean, but very well could be. And that is, I can see the calligrapher's ink hair. I can, you know, um, and that there's this waiting for, I love the, the long grain, waiting for that to soften. Mm -hmm. um, rice for breakfast, vegetables, and, you know, it's very common. Um, and the feelings that, that it felt like there was a comfort and a stability to the situation and the home. And is that, is that what you were looking for? I'm interested in what everyone else that. is hearing. And if <laughs> I'm in, I believe that this does give you a certain feeling by the time you get to the line, my father, Mm. watches and listens for the music of mm. comb against hair. It evokes a certain feeling in the scene. Um, so I can tell you what I get from it is this peaceful yeah. um, space and this ritual that this isn't yes. the first time. This isn't some fancy special occasion dish. This is the morning. Right. And it's early. It's before the birds. Yeah. Even. Well, and that's um, when, and, when I talk um, about, oh, sorry, go ahead. No, I'm just saying that that we have a sense of where we are in time and in the, this sort of family space. And then that ivory comb is so mm -hmm. vivid um, against the, the hair that's as black as calligrapher's ink. Yeah. And when I said stability, I guess I mean like a rhythm or this um, expectedness of this is how the morning goes, right? And there's a comfort in that, especially for a child when the mm -hmm. parents feel that way mm -hmm. and that you're right. It is a peaceful thing that it brings to the home. It just brings mm -hmm. that stability to that morning. It's like, mm -hmm. this is the morning routine and, and it's not a hurried routine. Mm -hmm. It's a spacious routine that yes. has time in it for the rice to soften mm -hmm. and for, mm -hmm. um, the father to kind of listen. Mm -hmm. Um, and there's not a whole lot of other sound going on. Yes. To hear the comb. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Wow. Okay. Yeah. It really slows us down. So you can think about the pace that you want um, for your story. What, and that's part of how you make the reader and the listener feel is, are you moving fast? Are you moving slow? Um, this is a slow poem, right? This yeah. Is slow, this is a slow softening of the rice and we become softened as we listen. And yeah. you have that power with how you use words of softening and slowing down um, whoever's listening to your story. Mm. Or and to go back for a moment to Cy Montgomery or building this tension, this sense right. of drama that the pig is in the shoebox and arriving home in mud season. And this was all very very possibly bad timing to adopt a pig. <laughs> well, so and, and Angela chimed in again. She said, it's a quiet familiarity. I like mm -hmm. that phrase. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. That's a good one. 
Yeah, I was thinking for your listeners, okay, well, I've chosen these sort of lyrical um, pieces that are set in nature and have this like warm, um, what's the word, sensory Mm -hmm. detail. And then I was thinking, well, what's a book, you know, who's a writer who's really more more guy? And I was thinking (laughs) this very tragic but um, extraordinary story by the um, author Norman MacLean called Young Men and Fire. Um, it was about the Man Gulch fire out West. Um, and a lot of young men lost their lives. Um, young men who were smoke jumpers who parachute out of planes, right. To fight Mm -hmm. fires. Um, and as I was looking in it, there was an image of, um, he was talking about the pilots who do these crazy flights into the bush close to the fire to drop the men down. They have to get there to fight the fire. And Mm. saying sometimes the planes fly so low, they get so low to release these smoke jumpers that the wings catch a bough of evergreen Oh, that is seen only when they land again in Montana um, Mm. in the airfield, um, that they have snagged a piece of the tree because they have flown so low. Yeah. So I wanted to share that too, that there's all kinds of sort of feeling to the imagery. I mean, you can feel that daring and um, uh, risk. Yeah. I think it's a risk even for the pilot to get that low with what the wind oh, sure. fire. But that for me is like an example. And I know we're really in the world of poetry, like an everyday person is like, well, how do I write like that? Well, you just keep thinking about the details and exploring what are the truths of the situation. And the truth is, it's a fact that sometimes the plane goes so it's low up, right. that it snags a bit of the tree. And yeah. what an image that is. This is green piece of a tree. Hanging in off the side. That's turning black and, and totally engulfed mm. in flame. You know, in our interview, one of the things that you mentioned um, was how we can actually go back, kind of close our eyes and go back. Because, you know, it's really easy to say, well, you need to get better at building details. So you need to put all your sensories in there. And then you need to add a bit of vulnerability and make sure we're kind of like getting the realness and the humanity and and the excitement. But I'm sure somebody's out there going, and I'm, I don't know, do you have, if you may have another point, but really quick in the podcast, you talked about closing your eyes and just kind of putting yourself back in that space again and smelling the smell smells like for the smoke jumper, smelling the smells of the smoke, smelling the smell of the rice, you know, smelling the smells of the pig manure. Um, and that's a way that we can actually do this. We don't often think of telling a story in that way. We think of just what are the things that we can say. And um, I think that for me, writing them out a lot of times will help me find these things because I am all in on the how do I want to make people feel, right? Mm -hmm. I got a couple of stories I've been telling lately about some things that have been going on personally. Mm -hmm. And my goal is to, I want them to be riled up with me. Mm -hmm. (laughs) I want them to be upset with me. Mm -hmm. And we're good at that. So taking, remembering kind of what it feels like to tell a story to someone, to have them immediately go, (gasps) oh, why, you know, Mm -hmm. well, that's what we're looking for here, right? That's the kind of thing. Yes. Okay, good. Yes. And so let's talk practical just for a moment. I'm so glad you mentioned that. Um, We can close our eyes. We can play if you want to work on stories. You can play with how you find your material and also how once you found it and landed on your idea, how you sort of excavate the detail, how you excavate the memories. And one can be literally closing your eyes. You can even use um, an app on your phone to record yourself talking so that Mm. you free yourself up from the starkness of the screen or Mm -hmm. the blankness of the page and just close your eyes and take yourself back without judgment Mm. and take dictation. That's what I often say. I'm working with an author right now um, who's working on a book and she's trying to weave in her stories to this nonfiction um, book. And I say, try to go back and not only um, see it as a movie in your mind with all of the detail, but also try to hear what was said by others. And also what was the sort of dialogue track in your mind? Mm -hmm. Because in life, we do have the inner and the outer going on all the time. And the 
I'll share this as another tip for storytelling, that a piece of dialogue can be very powerful and that dialogue can be the voice in our own mind. So you can go back and think, what was I thinking exactly? Not in fancy writerly words, but what was actually the thought running through my mind? Or when I'm in that type of situation, what kinds of things run through my head? And write that down yeah. or speak it. It's very powerful to take us there with you. And, and a lot of times I have to qualify. Now, I didn't say this part out loud. <laughs> Because <laughs> what was going on in here, you know? Right. But it's, I think it's easy to tell to tell those kinds of stories when we get riled up about something. Um, but as we kind of wrap it up, this has been extremely valuable. Just having these two main points. Was there another point you wanted to share, or is this kind of the these are the main pieces that we need to like start working on being able to tell better stories and using them. As we, you know, because not everybody's a podcaster, not everybody's going to speak on stages. I love that you said when we write, you know, I've resurrected my blog. And last year I participated in the 100 Day Project. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Mm -hmm. And what I did was I wrote every day and it helped me learn my story. Mm -hmm. And I started out because I wasn't comfortable. I started out with my voice app on my phone mm -hmm. dictating. And the easiest way for me to dictate that was to talk to my mother who has passed. She mm -hmm. died in 2017, but saying, mom, this is what I'm going to do. And this is what I'm talking about. So today I'm going to tell you about da, 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 da. And mm -hmm. then I used a dictation thing like Otter or whatever, and I popped it all in and then I just edited. Mm -hmm. And it, within five days, I was ready to just write. I didn't need to dictate any longer, but it was just getting that, getting comfortable with it. Mm -hmm. um, and then I went through uh, you know, as telling about this location, telling about my beach, it was, these are the smells that I, and I just did a whole thing on the smells and a whole thing on the sounds and a whole thing on getting there and a whole, a whole essay on leaving there and a whole essay on what it was like to participate in the tennis tournament. <laughs> it was just like, and it became this really good exercise for being able to tell those stories. So, um, Anyway, um, so I, I appreciate that and I love it. Yeah. Um, so well, I, I guess I would just add for folks to think about um, audience a bit. Think about um, a friend who just loves what you do, mm. loves what you have to say, leans in when you sit with them um, and wants to hear your story and write your story, create your story for them with them in mind or whoever your intended audience is, but someone mm. who's kind and receptive. That can be very helpful. And along with that, um, try to give yourself the freedom to go into the feelings that the story evokes for you. Because I think it was um, the poet Robert Frost said, no tears for the writer, no tears for the reader. Oh. Only if we let ourselves feel the power of our felt experience, are we really able to choose the words that then mm. give that felt experience oh, um, to others. And that's what we long for is to have that felt experience that you did, our own version of it. Yeah. And even just Sunday, my husband's a pastor. Pastors are notorious for telling stories, right? And yeah. some are good and some are not. But he shared a story um, on Sunday of the author who, the the guy who wrote it, the hymn, It Is Well With My Soul. And it's a, a sad story of his wife and daughters going on vacation and coming back and they're they're ship was sunk and he lost all four daughters. Mm -hmm. I may cry now. And I'm just telling it really fast. So I don't cry. But um, the wife was saved and, and ended up in England and he was still in New York and she sent him a telegram and she said, saved alone. Now, what do I do? Or what, what should I do next? You know, and um, literally <laughs> hit him so hard as a father. And as a, he was crying in the pulpit and I'm like, you have to stop. None of us get to, <laughs> we're supposed to sing. And I'm like, the tears for the writer, the tears for the reader is really, we do communicate in emotion. Mm -hmm. We do communicate in um, feeling. And when we feel, we communicate that with others. And we all want to be really professional. But the reality is when we're more real, it is more valuable. Mm -hmm. So that's a really good last word. Um, Sophie, where can people find you? I'm going to put your website up here. Um, and that is the best way to work with you. Is that correct? Yes. Um, thank you. Yeah. 
people can find out more about the kind of coaching that I offer, whether it's keynotes or getting ready for meetings in everyday life or telling stories um, in other areas of your life. Um, and you'll find on my about page, the tackle football story that yes. that was on um, GBH television here in Boston. <laughs> I love that story. And I told, I ran upstairs and told my husband, I said, you're not going to believe this woman I just interviewed. And, you know, being able to tell stories like that, when I look at you, I don't think tackle football player. Right? I mean, I have a friend whose daughter plays rugby and I look at her and I think she looks like a rugby player. Right. So I think it's beautiful to be able to share stories that not only um, cr create an understanding of the fact that we don't judge a book by its cover, number one, um, but also stories that help people understand, hey, anything is possible, mm -hmm. right? And as storytellers, as speakers, as teachers, as podcasters or, or um, writers, the goal is to change people. Right. So um, being able to have those, yeah, definitely check out the podcast. It came out this um, this last Monday and that story is in there. You'll hear other stories of how even just that story and the mindset that her, the things that her mom taught her changed her mindset in the way she thinks forever. So um, Sophie, we are thrilled to have you as an unconventional leader and loved having this today. Thank you so much for your time. And um we will we will look for more from you. I know that that you've got plenty going on. And if you want to find her, you can go to sophiewadsworth.com. And that is the best place to do it. Thanks so much for having me. And good luck with your stories, everyone. Yeah, um, definitely tag us. Um, the best, uh, if you're not on your website, or you're on LinkedIn more, right? Where are you more found? Oh, LinkedIn. LinkedIn or, or um, my website, you can sign up for my newsletter and get tips and presentation ideas there. How did we almost leave that off? <laughs> <laughs> it's on the homepage. I definitely you want You know, that. I'm not a marketing guru yet. <laughs> <laughs> That's okay. We will, we will help you out. So thank you so much. Y'all have a fabulous day. Tell us your stories. Tag us and share some stories. If you've got a story that you're sharing on social media or if you have questions, Sophie's really responsive. And I know that if you get on her email list, then you'll be able to hear um, all kinds of tips and um, stay tuned for more of these amazing guest speakers because we hope that they add lots and lots of value to your day. Have a fabulous one, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>